Good evening all, and welcome. This video has been graciously sponsored by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is an engaging and addictive subscription box service where you get to be a detective. There's been a murder, and it's up to you and your team to solve it. This involves sifting through piles of documents, evidence, audio recordings and case files, eliminating suspects as you go along to crack the case and catch the killer. It's a fully immersive experience with very high attention to detail that makes it all the more fun and feel oh so real. It's the kind of game you can play with your friends, family or partner. My wife and I have been playing it for a while now. And we have had the most fun during this whole COVID experience. And I highly recommend it. I know it's something that all of you guys will enjoy. Believe me on this. So why not punch in the code Mortis to get a discount on your first box? I know you won't regret it. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Because of my general interest in horror, and because they were appealing to me for a while, I collected dolls. It didn't matter what type. I had some porcelain ones, some pretty looking horror movie level dolls, that sort of stuff. They were generally creepy to the majority of people, and of course, they're haunted, was a joke that I often had. But I never had an issue with any of them. In fact, I thought they were all comforting. They all had names, and I had a history of picking them out, usually from antique shops, but I had two or three from a house sale after the owner passed away. On October 28th, 2017, my parents were out of town, so my brother and I were home alone, and my dad sent me a picture of the coolest doll they found at this church thrift shop. The doll was the epitome of everything I liked. I loved clowns and circuses, and the soft pastel colours were my absolute favourite. So much so that I was writing a story at the time that reflected these interests. The doll was perfect, it felt like it was for me, like in that Coraline sort of way, but instead of looking like me, it was just something no one else could have wanted. In all honesty, I don't think my dad would buy it, but lo and behold, when my parents returned I had a new doll to add to the collection. This was the first doll that I hadn't bought on my own or personally picked out, but I wouldn't expect it to matter. All of this happened, and I found out more things about the doll. One being that my parents bought it, and the cashier avoided touching it completely. On top of that, they said, Oh, you're buying him. Honestly, that wasn't uncommon. I'd been given a doll for free before because it was in such bad shape. One man's trash is another man's treasure. Having some aversion to a creepy doll was nothing new. Another interesting factoid about this was that my father, who is very strongly a factual person and doesn't believe in ghosts, even the slightest, said he felt this doll before he saw it. To say the least, my mum wasn't happy he went through with the purchase when she found that out. I remember vividly how excited I was to hold it for the first time. I got no negative feelings from it. This was just a doll. I do remember that one of the first things I noticed was his lack of eyes. I figured it was an old one, and the eyes had fallen out. If anything, it just made me like him more. The creepy clown doll, who I never named, quickly found his spot on my shelf, and all was well. I don't even remember when I started to get a bad feeling. It started minimally, small things like feeling uncomfortable around them, or that I didn't like them facing me when I was laying down at night. I was never uncomfortable with my dolls, and even when I didn't want to admit it, I wanted to be the weird girl who collected creepy dolls, but all of a sudden being around them made me anxious. I can only explain it as a deep vibrating in my chest that was nothing but discomfort to be in my room. I ignored it for the longest time, but being in that room alone was invoking an anxiety in me that I haven't felt before or since. At some point, I started having progressively worse nightmares, a reoccurring theme that they were never far from real life. In fact, 
They usually took place exactly where I was at the time, whether it be my bed, the couch, they were where those nightmares would be so convincing, you'd be unsure whether you had woken up or not. I recall two nightmares in particular, one where I was laying in bed, the room was dark, but not so dark, I couldn't see anything. I was laying on my side facing away from the dolls and towards my closet. The door slowly opened, and there was a really big doll just standing inside of it. Bigger than people sized, it looked at me, but only its eyes moved, and for a moment, that's all I saw before I awoke. This was my first experience with what I can only identify with sleep paralysis, but I don't know if I was actually unable to move or not, or if I was just too scared of what might happen if I did. Of course, nothing was in my closet. It sounds like a cheesy nightmare for sure, but to me this was terrifying. It made it hard to breathe, and made my stomach ring. The other nightmare was when I was taking a nap on the couch, and in the dream I woke up, and went to my room. When I went inside, I looked at the dolls, and they were moved. Then I woke up again, and this repeated. Each time the dolls became more and more scattered, laying on the floor, or completely broken altogether. Something was moving them. It couldn't have been an accidental nudge before I awoke. It looked like something had angrily shoved them all off the shelf. Eventually I did wake up, and the fear I felt as I slowly went to my room was unlike anything I had felt before. I walked as slowly as I possibly could, as if that was going to help with anything. I was just scared of the possibility that they might have been moved. I knew that if I went in my room and the dolls were out of place, something was really, really screwed up. I turned on every light I could. I was visibly shaking with fear, but nothing was moved. It almost felt like I was being mocked. The nightmares continued for a while with no attempts to be fixed. If anything, I just made them worse. Staying awake when I definitely shouldn't have been. Avoiding getting my REM cycle because, due to my research, I found that's when you had nightmares, which I didn't want. I can't remember any other specific nightmare, but a lot of it was just the fear and anxiety that accompanied being in my room. Being near the doll and how uncomfortable it made me. My dad even said he went in my room to get a pair of headphones, and his hip, which has been broken since I was about eight or so, was suddenly full of a shooting pain, and when he left the room it stopped. It was those small, strange encounters that made it so out of the ordinary. I would do anything to get away from that room when I could, and I didn't even realize it anymore. It was my subconscious telling me that I needed to fear my own space. It was my own subconscious telling me I wasn't safe there anymore, and I usually tried to listen to it. After New Year's is when I put all the dolls away. The night before I had decided to move all the dolls out of my room, I hadn't focused on the fear of any specific one, so I just moved them all out. That same night, I awoke and moved them back into my room. I don't know why, I just felt like they needed to be back. They couldn't be sitting out there. I just needed to move them back in. Apparently that morning I had been acting strangely, and eventually my mum and I moved the dolls into a box and into the attic. After I broke down explaining to her how scared I had been feeling about those dolls lately. My mum is a very spiritual person, so she was open to helping me put the dolls away. I haven't had an issue since, but I did do some more research on the doll a few months ago. For a while, I didn't like talking about them or even thinking about them, so I hadn't even looked at pictures of them. These were all things I found out quite a while later. A few things. For one, I finally looked back on all of this, and the one doll that did have eyes. In the picture my father sent me, which I needed to scroll through two years of messages to find, that doll, he had an eye. Of course, it could have fallen out during the drive. I didn't doubt the possibility, but I didn't push the doll's eye out. They were gone as soon as I had them the first time. Maybe it's a coincidence, or I'm thinking about it too much. On top of that, I couldn't find any other dolls that quite looked like it. My girlfriend and I found a few online that looked similar, but they were never an exact match. 
the colors were all wrong, the face shape wasn't quite the same, and I still haven't found any that do resemble the doll. I even tried reaching out to the manufacturers that created dolls that I thought looked like it the most, and assumed maybe there just weren't many pictures online, but I never got a way of contact. All I know is that it still deeply disturbs me when I think about that doll. My flatmates and I moved into a gorgeous house two months ago. Roughly two weeks in, we started hearing boot steps in the hall and on the front porch. We are in close proximity to the neighbors, but I doubt it's them we're hearing at 3, 4, and 5 a.m. Since moving in, I feel like I'm being watched when I'm in the shower. Just over two weeks ago, I was laying in bed watching videos on my phone, when I felt something tugging at my charger cable. We don't have any pets, and ever since then things have gotten progressively worse for me. I hear muffled voices outside my room at night, and I've checked them out on plenty of occasions, and there's no one there. And I can't hear anything from the neighbors either. On a night that I find myself home alone, i.e. without my boyfriend, I tend to have quite explicit dreams, though never with my boyfriend, and I wake up feeling guilty. If I'm at my boyfriend's though, they're always about being chased or messed up houses with traps and not being able to get away. When I'm home, I wake up with bruises that were not there before when I went to bed. I had one on my inner thigh, both, some on my upper arms, just blotches of bruising. I know I can be clumsy at times, but I know if I've hurt myself. I pulled an all lighter just over a week ago to do some work for a website that's launching soon. And I saw someone's head and shoulders around the corner from the dining room at about 5.30 to 6 a.m. Only one of the flatmates was awake. I asked if it were him, and he said it wasn't. Last week, I went to pull the lounge curtains because there was glare on the TV. I had my door open to air my room out because I'd been away for a few days. I saw the palm of an androgynous hand waving at me. I told my flatmate, and he said that they were going to check it out. We stepped into my room, and we were instantly freezing, breathing fog and all. It doesn't feel like my room anymore, it just feels wrong. That night, I decided I was sleeping on the couch in the lounge. But come roughly 5am, just as I was drifting off to sleep, I hear something tapping at the keyboard. All our computers are in the lounge, or we would never see each other because of work schedules. And I was the only person there, and as previously mentioned, we don't own pets. My computer was off though, so I couldn't see anything. However, it was staying on at night with a blank document open. All of this means I'm having a lot of trouble sleeping. And then just now, I heard four rather heavy raps at the window. I really don't want to look, and I'm not going to. I know there's something wrong in this house. So things at the new house have still been going on, and in some respects are picking up. The other day I left my phone on my desk while I went to the bathroom. When I returned, I noticed that my phone was half removed from the faceplate. Everyone else was either asleep or at work at this point, as the flat comprises, for the most part, of night shifts. About a week later, I had gone out the front door for a cigarette, as there was a pretty decent storm blowing, and the backyard offers no protection in a southerly. I had locked the door behind me when I came inside, because I was the only person home. Just over an hour late. I heard the front door open and close, and I went out to greet whichever flatmate had come, thinking that someone had finished work early. But I couldn't find anyone in the house, and the front door was now unlocked. 
About 4.30 the following morning, I was sitting at my computer in the lounge when my right shoulder got very cold. I peered sideways at my shoulder and almost noticed that a single strand of my hair was bouncing up and down, almost as if someone was pulling a pig's tail. I spent a few weeks away from home, and last night was my first night back in the house. At 1am today I went to go to the bathroom before going to bed. As I pushed open the bathroom door, I saw a black shadowy figure standing by the window. I thought nothing of it, as I was half asleep. But as I went to sit down, I noticed that the bathroom scales were going through the tarring process. These are electric scales, and have to be stepped on to turn on. But ever since you move, they have to be lifted slightly for them to register that you want to use them. After questioning the flatmates that were home at the time, I found that no one had been in that bathroom previously to me. And seeing that I use the scales regularly, I know that they only stay on for about 30 seconds after use, or 15 seconds if not being used after tarring. At midday today, I went to the loo, then decided I would shower as I needed to wash my hair for the weekend. I went to get my towels and hairbrush from the sleep out, and when I came back, I went to turn the door handle to quietly close the bathroom door behind me. So as to not wake up my flatmate in the next room, with banging doors after his graveyard shift, only to discover that the bathroom door had been locked. I'm thankful I hadn't completely shut the door behind me, not even five minutes previously, seeing as it was only he and I home. I hadn't worried about locking the door while using the loo, and also while I was showering, I noticed that a leg to the onesie that was hanging on the back of the door was sort of jerking around at odd intervals. But none of the towels or my gowns, which were also hanging on the door, had been moved at all. The weird dreams are still happening, albeit less frequently, while I was at my sister's place. This place still feels terrible. I sleep with my light on, and documentaries playing on YouTube and my phone. But thankfully, I haven't woken up with any new bruises in the last few weeks. I've had some weird things happen to me in my life, and after moving out of a house where there was an incident involving black magic, we got the government quarters in a society that was exclusively for the families of individuals working in the forest department. It was a cheerful place unlike the last, and there were many kids around my age. My school was close, and it was a well-knit neighborhood with friendly people. So much so, that I was able to trespass into anyone's house and they wouldn't mind. It was still one of the best places I had lived in, because more than anything, it was adventurous. There were tall Ashoka trees all around, many kutcher houses, and an aura that was hard to beat. This place had an old world charm. The only unconventional part about the place was my house. It was of older times, probably built around British Indian era, and had a unique architectural style. The front hall had a flat roof, while the middle portion was raised in a dome, and at the very end, near the washroom and beyond, there was no roof. The first time we entered, there were many bizarre wall paintings in the middle portion that we didn't comprehend at all. There were two doors for the entry of the house. The front one, and the one at the very back that opened in front of a fence, and behind that was a forest. There was a blackened dead tree across that, that had been the victim of lightning. We had a beautiful garden that was adjacent to the house, with lemon and custard apple trees at the end of it. It was our storehouse, and we didn't know who lived there before. The caretaker didn't tell us much, other than the person moved somewhere else. Still, we didn't want to take any risks and had a holy ritual performed on the property before we lived there. It was an interesting place. I made new friends and we used to play in the society compound all day long after school. 
The forest office was in the society itself near the main gate. The place was surrounded with rocky terrains and forest. As kids, we explored a lot, and I often saw soldiers from a farm marching around behind the terrains. There was another forest office in the compound, which was old and closed forever. It was locked, and the old office almost in front of my house, at a diagonal distance, was built on an elevated stage. It had high walls and a rotting structure. It was a home to many mossy outgrowths, and it had no roof either. By the side of it was a burnt house that had been abandoned. Nobody went there. It was instructed by the temple priest and his wife, as there was a black dog that lived there that had gone mad. We used to obey that, as it was near the forest. So poisonous snakes and monkeys were a daily sight, and we'd gotten used to it. The monkeys came every evening at five o'clock, and I had some really funny incidents with them. One day we were playing cricket near the old office, when an older boy played an aerial shoot to the building. There was no roof, so the ball went in, and I was sent to retrieve it. I climbed on the edges of bricks that were jutting out of the terrain adjoining to the office, and entered from above. It was a very creepy place, with a deadening black smell all around. I found some bones lying in the trash, probably left by dogs. I came out, went about my business, but there was something off. The next day in the morning, my mum came to us, as we were talking about some news. She had a dream last night, where she saw a lot of buried treasure in our house. It was in the back wall of our storehouse, and also there was some voice that guarded it. She saw someone digging there in the dream, a faceless man. We all went into the garden and opened the storehouse, and the wall at the back was put up again. Someone did try to break it down. It wasn't painted, and was mere bricks and cement, albeit thicker than the other ones. My mum didn't proceed further. She said that she heard the voice in her dream saying that to acquire the gold, one had to sacrifice their children, and it couldn't be escaped or bargained with and she wasn't willing to take such a chance. We went inside in a few minutes and heard someone at the door. It was our neighbor that lived far in front near the main gate adjacent to the new office. He had walked all the way down to our place and it was early in the morning. It was a bit surprising because we didn't have much interaction with him. He had a confused expression and he saw my mom and aunt and said, you'll find this funny but I had a dream about your house. He told us the exact same dream that my mum said, and even the same location. It was very strange. While we were all talking, we saw another girl walk towards us. She lived near the terrain, and to our surprise, even she had the same dream. Everyone wanted us to investigate now, but mum was in no mood. One thing that she wanted to do was know about the place, the caretaker was questioned, and he revealed that the person who lived there was of Anglo-Indian descent. He lived here some 22 years back and was a treasure explorer. He knew of the treasure in this place and tried to search for it. It was said that he sacrificed his own son to get the wealth, but wasn't able to bear the guilt and went crazy and disappeared. The broken wall was put up by someone at night the day he disappeared. No one saw who did it. The man had murdered his son right in front of our washroom in the last section that opened near the forest. It gave me shudders, because there were frequent power cuts in those days at night, and I used to take long showers at midnight. The idea of something lurking and guarding the walls and adjacent treasure were enough to give me chills. We mutually decided to do nothing about it, and left town later that year. This happened when I was around 15 or 16. I still remember the craziest details, but this is not one of them. Since I was a kid, my biological mother had sort of shoved religion down my throat, 
So over the years of not seeing her and just living with my dad, I had developed my own belief in myself and my independence. Ghosts, spirits and energy weren't really on my mind at the time. I was always interested in horror movies and stuff like that. My dad was on a trip to Mexico. He had called me one day after I got home from school and asked me if I wanted anything. As my dad and stepmom would usually buy me a little traveler gift or something when they went on business trips. I said yes and asked him what the options were, whether it be a keychain or a poster. He said he had stopped in a shop that was sort of deserted, like it was being shut down or going out of business, and it was located in the middle of nowhere. He said that there were some old paintings and being into art at the time, that really piqued my interest. I only remember the description of the one painting that he had described, solely because of the occurrence that had happened once it was in my possession. That had a very old, dark wooden frame, and it wasn't super smooth, but wasn't rough or beat up or anything like that. The painting itself looked like it was on white marble, and what the painting is, is that almost a cartoonish traditional skeleton, dancing in a graveyard, wearing an outfit that Shakespeare might wear. The painting overall looked really cool, but as soon as I got it, something was off, and it wasn't super noticeable. But when you look at it, it just was unsettling in the slightest. The first occurrence I had with this painting was the first week after I had owned it. It was hanging over my door, and may I add that at the top of the painting there is an extremely super thick rope that is used so I can put a nail there so that it can hang. I had gotten out of the shower after I got home from school, and I walked into my room. As soon as I walked through the door, the painting fell, and I felt the wind from the painting fall behind me, and it felt like it was a few inches away. Any other day I would have just dismissed it, and thought about how crappy it would have been if the painting had hit me, but I didn't realise that there was something extraordinary going on. So I put my clothes on, got a stool, and spent about three minutes making sure the painting was not going to come off the nail. When I got off the stool, I gently pushed the side of the painting to watch it swing back and forth to ensure that it would stay put. I had to make sure that the only way the rope would come off the nail was if you were to push directly up and pull it off. I left and walked into my bathroom to take a leak and pick up my clothes from the floor and when I walk in, back through the door into my room, the painting fell off and hit me in the shoulder. This had honestly freaked me the hell out on many different levels, and it doesn't even stop there. I picked up the painting from the floor and then tossed it in the closet with all my dirty clothes. And being at about 15 or 16, obviously it was just a pile on the floor. After about a month, I told one of my friends about what happened with the painting. And to this day, something tells me that I probably shouldn't have told anyone about this, because nothing had even happened until I brought it up with him. The next morning before I had to go to school, it was extremely early, and I had woken up and couldn't get back to sleep, and it was before any of my parents woke up. I couldn't get back to sleep because I didn't realise that my instinct was picking up that there was something else in the room with me. I sat up and just sat there and stared at the closet doors. I sat there for about five minutes, debating on whether or not I wanted to see what had sounded like scratching coming from the inside of my closet. I threw up my blankets, pulled my feet onto the floor, but as soon as I stood up, the moving in the closet stopped. At this point, it was reacting to the sound of me which was scary and terrifying because I realised that the painting was in there 
and from what had just happened the month before. I stood there for a solid minute, just staring at the door, and when my anxiety got so high, I just ran up to the door and threw it open. Nothing. Just a pile of clothes. And no, the clothes weren't a month old. I just kept the painting on the floor because I really didn't want to touch it. I just stood there looking into the closet and down to the floor when I noticed the corner of the painting. As soon as I made eye contact with it, there was an inhumane and grotesque, deep-pitched growl that emanated from the closet. And the scariest thing about all this was that I could feel the sound vibrations in the floor and in my chest, and there wasn't even anything there. I was feeling the vibrations from something I couldn't even see that was making the noise. I ran out the room and went downstairs for the remainder of the hour that I had until I had to actually get up for school and sat on the couch watching TV in the kitchen with all the lights on downstairs. After this happened, my mental health rapidly declined and I was diagnosed with clinical depression, anxiety disorder and ADD, all of which I'm sure I would have been diagnosed with regardless. It just felt like when I was home, these feelings intensified by 10. My parents didn't believe me, so I gave the painting to my dad and told him to put it in storage and that I didn't ever want to see it again. About a year later, and a quarter, I was 17. I had switched rooms and moved into my sister's old room because she had moved out. I had put the painting up on the wall, but was only there a week until I had an experience where I woke up with my body facing the wall and couldn't move. I had passed out and left my door open and heard something had started from the stairs and then began to walk through the hallway and into my bedroom. As soon as the steps stopped by the side of my bed, I could move, but nothing was there. My family owns a big dog and a small dog, but I know it wasn't the dogs, because when they walk on the wooden floor, you can hear the sound of nails, and it's very high-pitched. I haven't seen the painting since after that happened. I saged my entire house and hit a dip in my mental health again. It was messed up and evil. I was paranoid, and my parents thought I was just lying, since I was also dealing with the issues between me and them. Safe to say, I never want to see that painting again, for fear of what it might do. This happened a few years ago, when I was 15 and had just started buying cassette tapes. Now, the reason why I did this isn't relevant to the story, so I'll make it quick. As many of you may know, concert tickets have gone up since not many people buy CDs, records or cassettes anymore. Me, trying to be a world changer, I figured I could start a ripple effect and everyone else would magically start to buy them again. Yeah, right. Anyway, I'm a huge Metallica fan, and I had been looking for a Master of Puppets tape. I'd basically given up on trying to get my hands on a Killer Mall tape. I didn't trust eBay or most online retailers. But lucky for me, there was a guy at my school who sold CDs called Dave. He was a little on the sketchy side, but at least I knew that if I got ripped off, I'd have an easier time getting my money back. I approached him one day and asked if he had a Master of Puppets tape. As soon as I asked him this, he went white as a sheet, looked extremely sick, and I said, Dude, are you alright? He didn't say anything, and just looked at me as if I had said a forbidden name. A few seconds go by, and he grabs the tape from his locker practically throwing it at me, taking my ten bucks as he speed walks away. I stood there for a moment still in shock by how he reacted. 
I looked at the box. It looked like a normal master of puppets tape box. You know, with the graveyard cross headstones and the hands in the dark red sky. Then came the moment of truth. The actual tape, and if it was legit. I opened the box and inspected it. Yep, it was legit. Now my only concern was if the thing actually worked. Because it wouldn't have surprised me if I went home and it wouldn't play. My concern was soon replaced with dread. And honestly, I didn't know why. Something about the tape began giving me bad vibes. My stomach felt sick just holding it. My instincts kept telling me to just throw it in the trash and get one somewhere else. But I didn't. Fast forward through school. I get home, pop the tape into my cassette and press play. Nothing. I take the tape out and put it back in. Still nothing. I take the damn tape out about six times. And nothing happened. At this point, I was annoyed, because I thought this guy had ripped me off. That would explain the behavior when he gave it to me. I gave it one final attempt, and it didn't work. So I was going to confront him the next day. I put the tape in and pressed play once more, and there was nothing. Well, that guy better not have spent that 10 bucks. And as soon as I was reaching to turn it off, a blood curdling scream came spilling out of the tape. Unless James Hetfield had taken hormone pills to sound like a woman, I didn't think the screaming was coming from him. I mean the sound. It sounded like she was being buried alive. Whatever the hell it was, I hoped it wasn't real. I repeatedly pressed pause, but it wouldn't stop. This went on for about five minutes, and in that time, a light bulb five feet away from me exploded. Other people may just shrug this off as a coincidence. I couldn't do that, no matter how hard I tried. After five minutes, it stopped. However, the tape didn't. It went straight into the song, Battery. Keep in mind that I've listened to the whole album numerous times, and while Battery is the first song played, there was absolutely no screaming whatsoever. I didn't know whether to be scared of the screaming, or the fact that it made the light bulb explode. I grew a pair and played it again. This time there was no screaming, and it played like a normal album. How is that possible, I thought? How can it have that horrific scream one minute, and play as if nothing happened the next? Was there something wrong with the cassette player? I didn't know. But how could a cassette player cause something like that? Giving in to my stupidity, I played the tape again. This time, all the lights in my house went out, surrounding me in darkness, alone with this tape. By now, I had lost myself. I knew that the tape was giving me bad vibes. And by the way Dave had acted, he had to have known something was up with it. I had enough. I took that thing out and completely smashed it. After smashing it, I made sure to put it at the very bottom of the trash barrel outside, because there was no way I was keeping this thing inside. Even if it was in the trash can under the kitchen sink. I couldn't sleep that night. The nightmares I had about the screaming woman kept waking me up all night. Not only that, I felt like something was watching me throughout the night. My skin crawl was just thinking about it. The next day, when I went to look for Dave, he wasn't there. Going through the motions at school, I felt nothing but dread. Had something happened to him? Was it because of that tape? Or was he just skipping? There was no way to tell. I got home and I felt the urge to look into the trash barrel. I slowly opened the lid, praying to see its smashed remains at the bottom. Nothing. It was gone. My heart dropped. The feeling of dread was now getting overwhelming, and I felt an anxiety attack coming on. I tried to reassure myself that maybe I had just thought I put it in there. Maybe it was inside the trash can inside. 
but no. I specifically remember bringing it out there. All of a sudden, I heard screaming. The woman, and it sounded like it was coming from inside. I ran inside and my legs turned to jelly. The tape I had smashed was now playing in the cassette player, not to mention that it had somehow gotten inside. There was nothing I could do but sit there, waiting for this to end, hoping to God it was just a nightmare that I would wake from at any moment. I have no idea what the hell happened to that tape to make it so evil, but I don't want to find out. The sounds of the woman's screams still haunt me. It also doesn't help, the tape keeps coming back, no matter how many times I destroy it. However, I learned a lesson from this, and I hope you did too. Be careful who you buy from. When I was 16, I got a job as a personal assistant slash cleaning lady for a very wealthy couple who lived in a big, beautiful mansion on Lake Michigan. It was a great job at the time, but after a while I had to quit because of everything that was going on. I made $12 an hour as a 16 year old girl. And that was just crazy to me at the time. But now I know it's because the homeowners couldn't get anyone to stay and work for them. It could very well be because they're both major assholes. But I honestly didn't see them all that much during the school year. So it was fine. I would work 40 hours a week in the summer and part time while I was in school. During the school year, I would hardly ever see them homeowners and would be left alone to clean the house. I had a key, alarm code and gate code. So I could let myself in and out. In the summer months, I had help from a few other employees. But in the school year, I did not. At first, I loved being in the house by myself. Don't get me wrong. The place was absolutely gorgeous, right on Lake Michigan. So I always would open the curtains to let the sunlight in and blast the surround sound speakers while I cleaned. It wasn't until I was by myself that I started noticing how weird this place was. Nothing ever exactly felt welcoming about the place. Sure, it was pretty to look at, but it was modern and everything was hard marble and stone. Not very homely feeling. My first experience happened when I was cleaning one day in silence. I remember specifically not turning on the music because I had a bad headache that day. All of a sudden, the speakers to the upstairs part of the house turned on. The way their speaker system works, you can control it by a touchpad in the kitchen which would play the music everywhere besides the basement and master bedroom. To play music in those areas, you'd have to go to that touch pad and turn it on by controlling the pad and sync it up with the rest of the house. The reason that was so alarming was I was the only one there. I walked up the stairs to check out what was going on and figure out why and how the music had turned itself on seemingly by itself. I looked around and called out the homeowner's name, thinking someone came in without me noticing or something like that. But the doors were all still locked and no one was home. I shut off the music and went back downstairs not thinking much of it. It started happening more often. I'd be listening to the music and it would turn off or it would be off and would turn on in a completely different area of the house. I brushed it off as faulty and didn't think much of it. The second most prevalent story I remember from working was when I was cleaning the workout room in their basement. I never wanted to go in this room and I really couldn't tell you why. Something about this room was weird. It was just super cold and dark 
and I felt very anxious while being in there. I definitely tried to avoid it. But my boss would get mad when dust would build up. So I forced myself to go in there once a week to tidy up. I was in the workout room, using a broom and a mop. And I remember sweeping up the floor and prompting the broom against a machine while I used the mop. Suddenly the broom fell over, hitting the wall, the baseboard, and the floor as it fell, causing three distinct knocks. What I heard after scared me so badly, I refused to go back into the room by myself again. Immediately following the knocks made by the broom falling, three knocks responded in the exact same pattern the broom fell. But it was coming from inside the wall. I know what you're thinking. But no, it was not just an echo. It was not a scared animal. It was knocking. Deliberate knocking. I was completely alone in a big quiet house in the middle of nowhere. And someone was knocking back at me from inside the wall. To this day, I have absolutely no explanation for what I experienced. Lastly, this was the first and only time I have ever seen anything paranormal with my two eyes. Then I know this time, it's not me being paranoid or crazy. Because I was with a co worker who saw it too. Sometimes, my boss would rent out her guest house, and we would clean it before the guests arrive. So this guest house has a glass hallway leading from one main area of the house to another. I was cleaning the glass while one of my co workers, Bob, was standing next to me. Just then, I catch a glimpse of what looks like a boy in a blue shirt running by. I turned my head just as Bob turned his, and he asked if I had seen it too. Those are the craziest things that happened. It was nearly six years ago, and will always haunt me. A number of years ago, me and my boyfriend went on holiday to Mexico. We were looking around the pyramids on one of our tours. And as we're getting back to our hotel, my boyfriend sneaks me off to the side away from the tour guide and shows me something he has in his pocket. By his face, he had been itching to tell me for a while. I thought he'd been acting funny. And that's when he pulls out a small rock. I look at it without much interest, and go back to hearing the tour guide. When he pulls me over again and says, Listen, I got this from the ruins. I give him a puzzled look. Why would you do that? I say. I thought it was really cool to have a piece of history with us forever. We can put it in our house. I give him a faint smile. I wasn't really sure why he decided to take a random rock home. But I didn't think it was such a terrible thing. Anyway, that night, I had the worst dreams ever. I dreamt that I was seeing my closest friend Abby with only one arm. She was trying to tell me something, but it was like she was underwater, frantically waving her arm and stump. And I woke up in a cold sweat and it really freaked me out. I called her up back home but she was still asleep. Figures. I tried going back to sleep, but there was a deep rooted sense of fear in my gut. And something was preventing me from sleeping with ease. I tossed and turned. And then my boyfriend poked me in the side. I instantly turned and asked him what was wrong. He said he had a horrible dream that my friend Abby only had one arm. This freaked me out a little. I hadn't said anything out loud. Even when I tried attempting the call, I didn't leave a voicemail or a message of any kind. There was no way he could have known or heard me. I brushed this off as a simple coincidence. But for the next three nights, I didn't sleep well. And a general feeling of unease overcame me. 
We had a few days left of the holiday still, and one afternoon, as I was sitting up in my room, waiting for room service, as I wasn't feeling all that well, did I see a shadow, about half the size of a normal person, dart from our bed to the bathroom. I was reading a book at the time, and I just about crapped myself. I don't move, feeling completely vulnerable. I just stare at the corner where it went towards the bathroom, and listen, and wait. Minutes pass, and with trepidation, I scoop myself off the bed, and look past the corner. There's nothing there, no one to be alarmed about, and I start to get scared. That's when I see the rock my boyfriend took from the ruins. It's just on the glass table in front of the TV. And I wonder, all of this started when he brought the rock. Could it be? I go downstairs to rejoin my boyfriend a little while later, and start speaking to him about the rock, and asked him what made him want to bring it. He confessed he just thought it was cool, and would be something fun to show the lads. I gave him a snort, and went to speak with the bartender, and get another drink. We started a conversation, and I steered it towards culture and history, and then finally towards the ruins. I wanted to be subtle, and I said that I heard of the people that took objects from ruins, like rocks and stuff. His demeanour changed from the happy, pleasant tone we were conversing in prior, and he looked at me and said, Did you take something from the ruins? No, I said, lying through my teeth. Good. They say that those who take from the sacred sites are haunted by a Lucius. I asked him what this funny word meant, and he said that in Mexican culture, they are these tiny dwarf-like spirit things that can drag your soul to the ground and kill you if you're not careful, but they are not to be trifled with. I understood them to be somewhere between a ghost and a bogeyman, but I took his warning very heavily, as I had seen something half the size of a man earlier that day. I told my boyfriend later in the evening that I was having misgivings about him having taken the rock, and convinced him that the best thing to do would be to return it. So he begrudgingly agreed, and we took the same tour again, albeit with a different tour company to not be suspicious, and he returned the rock exactly where he found it. I'm happy to say the rest of our vacation was spirit free and the feeling of unease lifted. Whether the feeling was in my mind or not, is another matter. But I know that I saw that shadow dart from our bed to the bathroom, and it's something I'll never forget. Don't go pilfering sacred sites, people. You never know if you might bring more home with you than you expected. I regularly go thrift shopping in my small town in Ontario, Canada. About three weeks ago, I went to the Salvation Army to pick up some vintage finds. I sometimes go into the housewares and art section to see if there's anything worth picking up to resell. And that is when I saw it. I had always been interested in creepy, unsettling, and dark things, and this painting immediately caught my attention. It was as if it were begging me to take it home. I was overwhelmed by this sense of urgency. I needed this painting now for whatever reason. The more I looked at it, the more I discovered new details. It's not a particularly nice painting. It has a very unrefined feel to it, but it was not the style that drew me in, it was the subject matter. It was so odd. I ended up adding the painting to my cart, and continued to shop around. The painting ended up costing me only two dollars, 
which I considered a deal, since it came in a very nice old frame. I had it in my room for a few days, before I noticed strange things happening. I live alone in an apartment, and it's generally quiet and peaceful. This all changed by the third day that I owned the painting. At first, harmless things were happening, and I thought nothing of them. Instances included cupboards opening, things falling, lights flickering. I just attributed the cupboards opening to me being forgetful. Things falling as me not properly putting things back, or the light bulbs as needing replacing. By the sixth day, the nightmares started happening. In my nightmares, some dark figure approaches the side of my bed from my closet. While I'm stuck in some sort of sleep paralysis, not being able to do anything while it comes towards me. It gets closer until it's at the side of my bed. It looks at me while frozen, but doesn't even have eyes. I've had this recurring dream for five or six nights since I obtained the painting. All with the figure from the painting coming to visit me. After the first nightmare, I knew that these incidents had something to do with the painting. The energy coming off it was just dark and it got darker and darker until I was so uncomfortable that I moved the painting out of my room. Here is where things get even weirder. I decided to investigate the painting further and take it out of its frame. As soon as I took it out of the frame, this smell enveloped my house. The painting never smelled prior. It was only when I removed the glass and wood frame that the stench of sulfur came over everything. It was putrid. I immediately noticed the back of the painting, and it is terrifying. After the fifth or sixth nightmare, I moved the painting to my basement storage locker at the bottom of the apartment complex. The dreams have stopped, but the cabinets opening and stuff like that still happen. Something else started too. I sometimes woke up in the middle of the night to hearing what sounds like scratches in my front door. When I go and investigate, there's nothing there. I've asked my neighbors, but they don't hear anything. In addition to the paranormal occurrence, my health has also taken a hit since I got the painting. I've been feeling unwell, run down and depressed all the time. I tried telling people about it, but no one really believes me. The only one who has said anything that makes me feel like I'm not crazy is when my dad came over and took a look at the painting. The first words to come out of his mouth were, Damn, that's dark. The painting itself has a very odd subject matter. This is what I see. Please let me know if you see anything different. There is a dark figure sitting in a wooden chair staring into a mirror with its hand on its head, almost as if it is in shock. In the mirror, it is not the person's reflection, rather another dark figure standing in it. It almost looks like its hands are cut off, its arms are long, and there looks to be blood on the mirror. The walls are cracked, and show plaster. There are also scratch marks with the same red on the mirror as on the wall. I'm wondering if this meant the person in the chair is trying to escape. There is also a box, which kind of reminds me of a Dybbuk box in the corner of the room. Possibly the most disturbing part is the upside down family portrait. I have no idea what it all means. Hopefully someone can give me some advice on how to remove the spirit from disturbing my home and my dreams. The artist is unmarked. There's no date, either. If anyone has seen any similar paintings or styles, I'd love to get in touch. I want my life to go back to normal. I'm sure some of you people will probably tell me to throw it out or burn it. 
and I would. But I have this irrational fear that whatever spirit resides in that painting will get angrier. Almost two years ago, my boyfriend and I decided to move from one house to a much bigger one that had belonged to his aunt. At the time of the move, my son was two and my daughter just a few months. A few weeks after moving in, I noticed my son would get out of bed and walk down the hallway and not say anything, just stare at me. I would ask him if he needed something, but he would never respond. I'd pick him up and carry him back to bed. I assumed maybe he was just sleepwalking, since I also used to sleepwalk as a child. One night he wakes me up, and he's all in a panic, trying to get me to follow him into the living room. He would just keep randomly repeating, come on, mummy, come on. So I get up and we walk to the living room and the TV's on. It's just a static screen. So there's nothing playing and he's staring at me with a very blank expression. I assume he's sleepwalking again. I ask him if he turned the TV on and he said no. And when I asked him if he could turn it off and show me how to do it, he couldn't find the power button and got frustrated that he couldn't figure it out. The TV I had at the time is made a little weird. The power button is located on the back side of it to the right. And I assume it wasn't him who turned it on if he didn't even know how to turn it off. Not to mention that he's two. Fast forward a few months and I'm in the kids playroom sitting on the couch with my son who fell asleep on my lap while watching a movie. I heard movement in the kitchen. So I get up to see if my boyfriend was awake to find no one there. It felt weird like I was being watched. So I go back to the playroom and grab my son to put him in the bed. Over the next few weeks, I keep hearing people walking when no one is awake. One night we get home from a late night grocery shopping trip. And as I'm pulling bags out of the trunk of the vehicle, I hear someone humming. So I look around my yard to see if anyone is around or out for a late night stroll, which wouldn't make sense since I live on a random back road surrounded by woods. I walk around to the backyard and still see nothing. One week, my boyfriend's dad and stepmother decide to come and stay with us for a few days to visit. The first few nights they were here and everything was normal. But then one night, something kind of weird happened. My daughter was being extremely grouchy and absolutely refusing to go to bed. So I'm up with her in the living room at 12, trying to rock her to sleep and everyone else is already in bed. I finally get her to pass out at 1.30, lay her down and get myself in the bed. I climb under the comforter and pull out my phone to scroll through the internet and hear something like someone crawling into my room on the floor around my bed and over to my boyfriend's side where he's asleep. I'm a little creeped out because I know it's not my daughter. She can't get out of the crib on her own. Then I think maybe my son is up trying to sneak out of bed, but I'm still too nervous to look over there. So I get up and walk out the room to peek in on my daughter and make sure she's still asleep and then go down the hall to my son's room to see if he is still soundly asleep in bed. I get back to my bed and try to play it off like I had probably just imagined it and needed sleep. The next morning, everyone's in the living room drinking coffee and just talking. And I look over at my boyfriend and ask him if he heard anything last night. He said no, he didn't wake up last night. But his stepmom chimes in with, I heard you in the living room at 3 a.m. Does the baby usually keep you up that late? I told her it wasn't me. I was already in bed. When I heard the baby banging around on the walls and moving toys, I assumed you were still up. I told her it wasn't us and that we'd already gone to sleep at that point. And now, currently, I keep having the dreams of myself laying in bed at night, 
and a figure of someone just walking in the room and standing over me, only to wake up and realize it was a dream. Discomfort for sure, and I don't really have anyone to discuss this with, nor do my boyfriend's family have a belief in the paranormal. But I just really want to speak about it with someone, because it looks like I'm crazy. Have you ever heard of Kachina dolls? To understand these stories better, you have to know a few things about Navajo culture. They believe that you are not to own Kachina dolls, because it is said that they come to life at night. Traditionally, these dolls were made by Pueblo medicine men. When they were made, their creators would bless them and put their hair into the center of the dolls. This was before they were mass produced by other people and other tribes. The first story takes place in the late 90s. I wasn't there for this story, but it happened to my cousin. She moved into town and found a trailer to rent for a decent price. It was already furnished by her landlord that had just moved. She had asked my cousin not to move too many things, as she would be moving her stuff out over a period of time. Inside the trailer was a fake fireplace with a mantle on top. On the mantle were a collection of Kachina dolls. My cousin was a little wary of these, as they are tabooed her own, but she left them in place as requested by her landlord. The first night is when things started to get weird. So my cousin gets ready for bed and lies down. In the middle of the night, she is awoken by something dropping in the living room. She gets out of bed and heads to the living room turns on the lights as she gets there, and looks around to see what had fallen, to discover three of the Kachina dolls laying on the floor. She thinks nothing of it, and places them back on the mantle and heads back to bed. She was only lying down for about 30 minutes, before she hears the same noise. She heads to the living room to see the dolls on the floor again. A little weird and out, she places them back on the mantle and heads back to her own room. But before she gets there, she hears the noise again. Only this time, the thud is followed by what sounds like tiny footsteps. She goes to the living room to find the dolls further than they were when they had dropped in the first place. Definitely weirded out. She now tries to shake it off, and places them on the mantle once more, and goes to bed. She was in bed for another 30 minutes, when she hears them fall, and then, there are a little set of taps, like feet running across the floor. She finds the little dolls on the floor by the door. She concludes that there is no way the dolls could have fallen that far on their own. She was officially freaked out at that point, and decides to collect the dolls and put them in a box, and places the box in her closet. All night, she could hear the sounds of little scratches coming from the box. The next morning, she asks the landlord to take the dolls, and hasn't had a problem since. The second story takes place in the 70s, when my grandmother was a teenager. She decides to spend the night with her cousin on the res. They spend most of the evening swapping stories, trying to spook one another out, when her cousin gets the great idea to bring out the Ouija board. They start by asking the typical questions. Is anyone here? When did you die? And the like. They played for a few minutes, without any action, and put it away for a while. They pull it out around midnight to resume the game, and finally get a response. I don't know the specifics of what they initially asked, but it led to them asking, Are you here? The planchette moves to yes, 
and slowly drags towards the picture in the bottom right. The face of a man behind the woman using the board. They are all convinced that the other is moving it to scare the other. And of course, they swear they're not. So they decide to ask, where are you? And the planchette spells out chimney. They grab their flashlight and head towards the fireplace and shine the light. About five or six feet up the chimney, they find a Kashina doll hanging there. There was no explanation for it being there, and no one could have placed it there, as they had built a fire there earlier in the evening. The ashes were still warm. They decided best to stop playing, and my grandma hasn't touched a Ouija board since. My girlfriend and I both attend university, and we live in a relatively old apartment building in the town of St. Cloud, Minnesota. The building was constructed around the 70s, and though it's nice, something about it gives off an extremely eerie feeling, almost a dark, heavy feeling. But since rent is cheap and is close to campus, we moved in anyway. Let me preface and say that we live on the second floor of the building and have neighbors above and below us. We have never met our neighbors, oddly enough, but assume they are just older residents. We are both true believers of the paranormal and have always been curious about it. My girlfriend has never experienced anything paranormal firsthand, but for me, I have seen odd things throughout my life that I can't explain, and this experience happens to be one of them. This story begins as any normal night. We got done moving in and unpacking our things, and decided to take a break and relax for the rest of the night. We were watching Netflix, and we paused the movie and started to hear a loud banging sound above us, almost as if someone were constantly picking up and dropping heavy things. We look at each other and my girlfriend says, maybe someone's moving in upstairs? We didn't immediately think it was paranormal, so we ignored it. A few days go by and the banging started to happen around the same time it did the first. For some reason, we weren't creeped out or anything like that. We just thought this time was the only time that people above us could move in because maybe they got off work at that time. Later on, the same night, while getting ready for bed, we heard overly loud footsteps as if someone had heavy steel-toed boots and was purposely stomping their feet against the ground. While in bed, we all of a sudden hear a blood-curdling scream coming from a female upstairs. It was so loud, we could have sworn it was from right beside us. So we jolted awake and both had pale looks on our faces. We were terrified. We thought we should call the police, but decided not to. Perhaps it was a movie they were watching, but it was just too loud to be a movie. One morning I was in the bathroom getting ready to go to work, and I hear a faint cry coming from the same female voice, as if she were crying in the bathtub or somewhere near the bathroom since it was right above me. I then hear doors slamming and drawers constantly opening and closing. This sound goes on for another few minutes, and all of a sudden it's dead silent. My girlfriend wasn't around at the time, but she still believed me. No sounds of movement or crying slash screaming since then, and it's been silent for a few days now. The next week, my girlfriend and I decide to go to the front desk of the apartment building and tell them about the sounds we'd been hearing in our apartment. The reception lady looks at us confused and begins to hesitantly tell us that nobody has moved into the apartment and that it hasn't had a tenant in over two years. Dumbfounded, we ask if anyone could have broken in and caused the sounds, and the lady reassured us that if someone were to break into the apartment, the alarm would go off, alerting local authorities and the building security. But they never had any alarms go off, nor did we hear any. We can't help but think what's going on there and we decide to do our own investigation work and do some research at the local library in town. 
I didn't find anything that mentioned a murder had occurred in or around the area we live in. And to this day, I'm still trying to find answers. We do hear the sound on occasion, but knowing that absolutely no one lives up there just creeps us out even more. We don't know what to do and can't break our lease. It's the middle of the semester and we were too scared to sometimes even step foot in that apartment building. A number of years ago, my family moved into a new house in the countryside. It was a beautiful Georgian mansion, very rare and very old, beautifully maintained. The previous owners were selling it at a ludicrously low price. And my parents had always dreamed of owning a home like this. And so they obliged. It wasn't before long, probably within the first few days, that we figured something was off. The house needed a lot of work, restorative work, lots of the wood had started to go moldy, and definitely needed replacing. The previous owners obviously didn't live here. And as such, it had deteriorated considerably. In any case, my parents had a lot of work cut out for them. And it was while they were clearing rubbish away, that we saw something spooky. We were all just moving things and putting what we wouldn't need in bin bags to throw it out. When down the hallway, we looked up and all four of us saw a little girl happily and obliviously skipping away into the darkness. My dad immediately called out, Hey, what are you doing? And run over to see who this girl was and why she was in the house. His assumption was that she thought this house was still abandoned, which it no longer was, and was trespassing despite the fact there were now cars in the driveway. But upon a thorough search of the house, did he find nothing. Sightings of this little girl continued. There'd be some nights where I'd hear giggling down the hallway, or I'd hear my door creak open and see a pair of eyes staring at me before vanishing into the dark. Every one of my family members was afflicted by the curse of this little girl, her infernal laughter, the fact that she breathed behind your head, and when you turn around, she wouldn't be there. It was driving my parents mad. They tried to get in contact with the previous owners, but they had moved out of the country, and my parents were starting to see why. They did some local research and didn't find a lot about the house. But about four months later, when my mom was digging up the garden, did she unearth something unexpected? She found a shoe. And as she was pulling the shoe out of the ground, did she see that it was attached to a skeletal leg? The police were called, and it turns out that she had unearthed the remains of a small girl, probably no older than six to eight. This was a terrifying discovery. We paid for a casket and gave the little girl a funeral. Only after that did the activity truly die down. Not altogether though, just slightly minimized. As time went on, the activity nearly completely stopped. And we almost forgot that we had a ghostly inhabitant in our home. The house as it turns out, was a lot harder for my parents to do than they originally thought. It needed so much more work and money than they were prepared to invest, and sadly had to sell the property and take a loss. I was glad to no longer be the plaything of some spiritual girl from the fifth dimension. The next house we moved into was completely ghost free. And that's the way I think I'll have my life from here on out. I used to do contract security at the emergency room entrance of a downtown hospital, the graveyard shift. I would stand at a kiosk right inside the entrance and monitor access. 
Across from the kiosk were two sets of elevators. The first elevator on the right could only go up to the third floor. The two floors above us were administrative floors, offices only, no patient areas. So on my shift, floors two and three were closed for the night. The elevator on the left I had to be especially trained to use. It serviced the same floors as the elevator, with the addition of a helipad on the roof. This is where life flight helicopters would land with life or death patients that had to be rushed to the emergency room. Security would be notified when a life flight was en route, and we'd take the elevator, use our access key, and go to the helipad. On the roof floor, we locked the elevator in the open position, so no one could summon it from another floor. The elevator would remain open and in position until the life flight crew had the patient inside and hit the floor one button. Security was not needed to assist the life flight crew. We would take the stairs down as soon as we had the elevator prepped on the helipad. It had been explained to me that the process was important and that people had died on the pad and even during the elevator ride down. I'm not a ghost person, I've never had haunting experiences, but that elevator behaved very oddly. Every night I worked and the right side of the elevator that only serviced the three floors would rest on the first floor. Since it served floors that were not used during my shift, it just sat there on the main floor. I was required to check the second and third floors once a night. Whenever I went to the elevators, I never had to wait for the right elevator to get to my floor because it was already there. The left elevator that serviced the helipad and floors two and three had a mind of its own. All night it would go up and down from floor to floor with no one inside. You could watch the floor indicator for it. It bounced from floor to floor all night and it would lower to the main floor, open with no one inside, close, and then go to floors two, three, or five, the helipad. All this activity with no one inside it. The custodial crew was done on floors two and three by 10 p.m. Before my shift even started, there was no one around to use those elevators on my shift. On my nightly checks of the floors, I never saw anyone up there. The lights were even off. Not only that, but the left elevator would go all the way to the helipad by itself. You have to have an access key to even have that option. The other guards had no explanation. The hospital employees obviously didn't want to be seen as believing in a haunted elevator and would change the subject or brush it off when I asked why the lift was so weird. But I would watch from the security kiosk all night as that thing would go from floor to floor or shift. It would open up on the first floor across from me and it was always empty. The other elevator that only went to floors two or three never moved unless another security officer used it. This story takes place when I lived on my old property. I was a little boy, maybe eight or nine. You see, the cul-de-sac I lived in was a fairly nice neighborhood, nothing crazy. My room was across from my parents, just down a long hall and next to my sister's room. My brother and I shared rooms and a bunk bed. Everything was fine until my sister reached her teen angst phase. Then came the doll. It was a creepy looking porcelain doll with a black tutu and had a punk rock kind of motif and she loved it. She got it from her godmother, a woman we no longer speak to. My brother and my mum and I never liked the thing because it gave us the creeps, but hey, it was her doll. However, slowly but surely we began to see a change in her. She was beginning to become more reclusive and angry with my mother for no reason at all, and even cut herself in front of me once. Weird, yes, but nothing quite supernatural. Then she began to sleepwalk. At first, we thought it was normal, maybe just stress from being a teenage girl, I don't know, but she started to creep me out. And because of this, I began to lock the door at night after my brother fell asleep. And on one of these nights, I heard her get up from her bed and slowly walk. I was in my top bunk, mind you, watching under the door when I saw her shadow. See, as my room is across from my parents, 
I couldn't tell if she was standing there in front of my room or my parents, but it was still very creepy. And she stood there for an unnatural amount of time. On the last occasion, we all awoke one morning to a knife under my parents' bedroom door. And this just made them flip out. They weren't scared, they were more concerned about my sister being nuts and homicidal since she'd been acting so strangely. Things went on for a little bit until one day the doll disappeared and my sister came out furious huffing and puffing, but no one in the house seemed to have an inkling about its disappearance. And so life went on and I never knew what happened to it until I asked my dad about it years later and he enlightened me. It turns out that my godmother was heavily into black magic and Santeria and had a deep hate for my mother over some petty squabble they had before my father and mother were married and held a deep resentment for her. I guess firstborn females of the family is important in Santeria. And so when she saw an opportunity, she gave my sister that horrible doll we hated. But what actually happened to the doll was the funniest part. My mum is super religious, and I guess at some point she had soaked the doll in holy water and left it in the trash for the garbage man to take out to the dump the next day. Another funny thing, my sister never sleepwalked again. I was in Louisiana two years ago. I was in an antique store and came across a case of dolls close to the floor. I looked inside and a doll literally blinked in front of me without me touching it or anything in the vicinity, fully upright, as the eyes open and close when laying down for some of these. I came back to Louisiana to visit family and I went back two years later and purchased the doll. Maybe it was a mistake. This doll had very, very quickly began doing strange things. Full body apparitions, loud noises upstairs when no one was there, and making me itchy when I was around it. It also brings joy when it's not doing weird stuff, and it blinks its eyes in full view and isn't subtle at all. I sleep with the doll as I would rather it be closer to me where I can see it at night rather than somewhere I can't. I believe it to be harmless. It's from the 60s and it's a little Dutch boy. Looks like he's wearing home sewn clothes and hand whittled clogs. Does anyone have advice on what I should do? I really don't know. But there's a bit more. I thought about getting rid of the doll. I couldn't sleep for four days after sharing the first experience that I had. I was always looking around behind my shoulder and was scared beyond belief. I didn't want to get rid of it on my grandma's property, so I had to keep it until I was somehow able to dispose of it. I saw a full body apparition several times. It looked like a human, but fully flesh. It was almost like a hairless cat, dirty and seemed a bit bloody. Like I said, this was in the human shape. So it was extremely terrifying. Once I found an opportunity, I ridded myself of it. I drove into the country and found a tree with a hole in it, covered the doll in holy oil and left. My great grandmother just so happened to have blessed oil by the Pope. Not exactly sure which one though. After that, everything went back to normal. That antique shop seemed to have many seemingly haunted objects. Before I left to return to Georgia, I made sure to swing by the shop to say goodbye. I looked on the floor and saw a very old flat doll with a worn away print on the top being held down by a large brass cross. And I got a shiver down my spine. I am a collector of vintage and antique items, including mid century fashion dolls. I usually purchase them from thrift stores, 
estate sales or very occasionally on Craigslist. Recently I purchased a group of 1960s Barbie dolls that were a real bargain. I know the woman had a great knowledge of vintage dolls since she used to sell them on eBay, so she knew what they were worth. Still, I didn't question why she was selling them at such a low price. I was delighted with said purchase and couldn't wait to fix them up for my collection. A few days later, my bedroom suddenly became infested with flies. It was absolutely insane how many of these dirty little beasts filled my room. They seemed bent on driving me mad as they were constantly buzzing in my face or landing on or over me. Some folks say that flies are a bad omen that signify the coming of bad times. These flies were of plague-like proportions and were also a true enigma of why they arrived when they did. Around the time, I became very ill with flu-like symptoms. The weirdest part of this illness was a strange feeling like my brain was burning. I also experienced severe headaches that included crazy brain fog that felt like torture. It's hard to articulate exactly what the feeling was, but I've never experienced such an odd feeling in my head. It was so intense that ending my life crossed my mind. One last oddity to add to the pile. Usually I'm a very vivid dreamer with dreams that always have the same basic elements. After the purchase, my dreams have become dark and muddled. When I wake up, I feel exhausted as if I haven't slept. So why did I equate these mysterious happenings with the recent purchase of the dolls? I know it's not entirely logical, but it's just a strong feeling I have. What should I do? Could an inanimate object be cursed or bring bad luck? Maybe that's why she sold them for so cheap. I just want to add that I do not practice the occult nor believe in ghosts. The reason being is that after my father passed away quite recently, I saw no sign of him. My best friend also ended his own life some years before that. And I felt that if I were ever to experience a spiritual visit, he would have given me some sign. I just want to believe, but I can't. This happened when I was in my sophomore year in high school. I was at my friend Nick's house with a couple of other friends, and we were all staying the night. It was just the four of us high schoolers there that night. That same night, there was a severe weather warning due to a storm that had the potential to create tornadoes, which it did closer to the Connecticut River Valley and parts of Massachusetts. The wind, even without a tornado, was intense, and we were just glad that this house had a good-sized yard with no tall trees to fall. It was pouring rain. There was lightning and everything. We're all up on the second story of the top floor, and one of our friends was asleep and somehow managed to sleep through this. The rest of us were all awake, talking about how we weren't in danger of tornadoes, except one of us who was convinced we were all going to perish that night. Mid-conversation, there's a loud bang, and the entire house rattles. Okay, that's not supposed to happen. What could it be? We come up with some theories. Tree down, no trees. Earthquakes, no reports. Wind, well, there's no downed trees outside. And we're down to the bulkhead just slamming shut. Or something spooky. We grab a few knives and head downstairs. In the living room, we all notice for the first time how many porcelain dolls Nick's mother owns. We check every room to find nothing but those creepy dolls, but nothing that could cause a bang. There are two rooms left, the basement and a closet that's barely enough to fit folded linens. We decide that if the bulkhead isn't locked, then we forgot to close it and there'll be water in the basement, and the sound we heard was the wind knocking it shut. If the bulkhead is locked, we remembered to close it. The bulkhead was locked shut, the floor was bone dry, and the sound 
wasn't the bulkhead. There's one room left, the damn closet. What could be in a closet big enough for only Houdini himself to squeeze into? We open it up, and something falls, and we hear the sound of glass shattering. We look at the ground. It's one of the dolls. What was it doing in the closet? And why would it be propped up so easily to let it fall? We didn't care. We just went upstairs and did our best to fall asleep. It's something we all try not to think about. But everyone will once in a while be over there and hear a murmur or a grunt. And we'll never know where it's coming from. We also don't know whatever happened to the remains of that broken doll. When I was between the ages of 7 and 10, I lived in a house in a small town in Missouri. Nothing was abnormal about the house. I mean, normal house settling noises, which would cause me to have nightmares frequently. Until this incident that I will begin diving into. The only weird thing that ever happened was our keys going missing. When you walk in the door, there was a giant metal wood stove that we put our keys on. They went missing for weeks. We destroyed the house looking for them, and one day they just reappeared and nobody knew where they came from. Anyway, there was a doll back when I was younger called an Amazing Grace doll. She had holes in her ears so she could hear you, and would turn her head where the noise came from, and would say, Mama. Well, I loved this doll. I explicitly remember cleaning my room and propping Grace against the wall so she was sitting up. I lay down on my bed to read when I heard the clicking she would make when her head turned. So I looked up and stared at her and got the normal mama she would say after she heard something. So I tossed my book down and picked her up to make sure she was turned off. She was. I flipped her switch and then flipped it back to off, thinking that it was a normal malfunction. I set her back in a spot and plopped down to continue reading. When I started, she said mama again. So I went and took all her batteries out. I was over it at this point, so I just tossed her on the ground and went back to my spot. She started clicking quicker, and her head was moving back and forth, and she just kept repeating mama. I took off, I ran to get my dad, and he saw it and decided that we would burn the little doll. We did. But nothing happened again to my recollection, but my nightmares got worse. And this was when I was still religious, so I would put all my stuffed animals around me in a circle to protect me. I had a turquoise dream catcher and would pray every night for the nightmare to go away. They didn't until we moved. They weren't every day, but definitely several times a week. About six months ago, I received a haunted doll I bought off eBay. Now I have no idea whether this thing was actually possessed, but the previous owner claimed to have several bad experiences once she purchased it from a garage sale, claiming it smashed into her dinner room set when she was doing her hair in the bathroom. Walking out with a bat to investigate, only suspecting a break-in, only to find not a single sight of anybody or anything, and the dining wear and table was untouched. The next experience she had was when she was getting ready for bed and heard a noise coming from behind the chair. The doll was sitting in and say a dark figure with red eyes glaring at her with anger. Anyway, on to my ownership. When I received the thing, I was fully aware that a possessed object may not show signs of any activity from a few hours up to a few months of being relocated. I never experienced anything. I let it sit on a shelf and collect dust, only remembering it physically exiting my house every once in a great while. I would just randomly think about it, and even when I was doing something completely unrelated or busy at the house. A few days ago, I had lit a burn pile in my backyard to get rid of a bunch of branches and logs, when for some reason, I had the idea to grab the doll and burn it to be done with it. I went back to grab it 
and as soon as I touched it, my heart began racing, increasing with every step I took towards my back door. I had finally made it outside to the fire and tossed it back laying on the fire. Within seconds, it started smoking. As soon as it did, my heart stopped racing and I got relaxed. 30 seconds later, its hair and clothes were in full flames and I watched it as it began to look like something out of a horror movie. The eyes melted and sunk into its ceramic head and it was converted into a charred black soot until nothing but the head, arms and legs were left. I let the fire keep burning until all the wood had been burnt. My main question here is whether or not it was a good idea to burn a possessed object. If it is, I don't know what to think about it. Let me know what you guys think about my decision to set the thing alight. When I was 10, my mum ran a daycare of sorts out of our house. My sister became friends with this vindictive, seemingly void of anything good, girl that my mum babysat. This girl used to brag about her brothers being able to make her troll dolls walk off her dresser at night. We obviously thought that she was full of crap, because she usually was. Her brother and his friends used to go cut themselves in a graveyard that was overlooked by a cult compound at the edge of town. Anyway, one day my sister and this girl got into some kind of spat, and the girl stole one of her Barbie dolls. My sister was livid, because like most girls, she was obsessed with her Barbies. So the next time this girl comes over, she returns the doll. Only it had half of its hair cut off and replaced with horse hair. It was sewed in. That night, my sister runs into my room, screaming at me that her Barbies are alive. Now, we grew up in a pretty strict religious environment where lying was met with a beating. Being that my sister was the least likely to lie out of us three siblings, I started to get freaked out. According to her, she woke up and for some reason couldn't take her eyes off this particular Barbie. She said it stood up, stretched out like a human would after a long sleep, and turned her head to look right at my terrified sister. My sister pulled her covers back over her head and the Barbie ran down the stairs. And that's when she came bursting into my room all frantic. I was so sure she was telling the truth that I sat at the top of our stairs with my metal Tonka truck, ready to smash it if it came back up. We never saw the Barbie again. Every time I've asked my sister about it as an adult, she still sticks to the same story. Unfortunately, I'm a Goodwill addict, and I saw this gorgeous picture that I simply had to have. It was a whole $5, and when I took a closer look, it was a black and white puzzle that someone had put into a heavy duty frame. A big cat sprawled out into the snow, with snow falling all around him, done in black and white in a steel frame. It was very beautiful. Anyway, I get it home and hanging it in my guest bedroom. My bestie comes to visit, and she is standing in the guest bedroom doorway getting ready to take a shower. I come over to the doorway, and we were there just gabbling, and something caught our eyes at the same time. The picture lifted up and away from the wall, and gently fell onto the carpet while propping itself up against the wall. She looks at me and asks if I had just seen that. I reply that I did. This picture slash puzzle is very heavy. Two zigzag brackets in the back to hang on two corresponding wall nails. I picked the picture up and made sure everything was secure. The brackets were perfectly fine. The nails were both still in the walls with no sign of stress. 
my bestie stays a few days longer and leaves. While she is with me, no other events occur. And after she leaves, I get this floodlight on the closest door. And there are zero lights from the window. And I'm standing in a pitch black bedroom with a glaring bright light on the closet door. It lasted one week and disappeared. It was simply too odd. This happened about 12 years ago, when I was about 11. It was the day after Christmas, and my mum and stepdad and I were sitting in the living room watching TV. It was past 9pm, and my little brother had already gone to bed. Now my brother and I had gotten remote control cars for Christmas, the kind that had rechargeable batteries in both car and remote. As we were watching TV, my car that had been in the middle of the living room floor, starts making a noise like it's turned on. At this point, all three of us look at it and witness it drive around in circles twice to make a perfect three point turn, then park up against the wall. We all kind of just look at each other and my mum goes to check on my brother as he was supposed to be in bed. She comes back looking a bit concerned, saying my brother is flat out. And when he sleeps, he really sleeps. There's no faking the bear snores he gives off. So she then asks me and my stepdad whether we were playing a prank. We both deny it. My stepdad, even pointing out that the controllers to both cars had been on the side table where my brothers and I left them after playing with them earlier in the evening. My mum proceeds to check both controllers and the cars for batteries. All the batteries were in the charging docks, plugged into the wall, and we had run the batteries out while playing with them earlier. My mum, brother and I had some strange experiences in this house, but this was by far the strangest I have ever experienced personally. I can't think of a logical explanation for this. I've always thought, perhaps, it was a ghost. I was very young when this happened. I don't think I'd even started going to school yet. I don't remember much about that stage of my life, but I still think about this experience to this day. It was near Christmas, and there was a doll my younger sister and I looked forward to playing with every year. It was an angel, where you'd press the button and she would sing Silent Night. The thing is though, once I was done playing with it, I had to return it downstairs. My parents eventually realized we forgot to bring it downstairs, so I was sent upstairs to retrieve it alone. As I went to my room to get it, I heard the doll sing Silent Night. The doll had a history of going off on its own, so I thought nothing of it. I went up and opened the door. My room was completely dark at the time. But when the light from the hallway came in, it shined on the pitch black figure of a little girl who was playing with the doll. The girl immediately turned her eyes on me and I stared back at her in shock. My vision blurred and my ears were ringing. And the next thing I knew, I had to pick myself up from the ground. Nobody seemed to notice I hadn't come downstairs and confused and unable to comprehend what happened. I would just go downstairs with the doll, seeing as the girl has left. I return the doll and carried on with my day, because I had no idea what the hell had just happened. My brother used to live with our aunt for a few years. My youngest cousin, who was a little girl back then, was made to share a room with her older sister, so my brother could use her room. My little cousin's room was filled with dolls of all shapes and sizes, as in the only space in the room without one was the bed and a few steps leading to it. As expected, this creeped out my brother all the time, and he would take his time to reposition them in a way that their backs faced him instead. But without fail, every time he woke up, all the dolls were facing him again. He said there were even three or four dolls 
that always, always ended up sitting beside his head, even if he had put them away in the cabinet or locked them out of the room. At first, we tried brushing it off by saying it couldn't have been our cousins playing a prank on him, until it went on even when he was alone in the house for days. He got so used to it, it didn't bother him anymore after a few months, as it happened to him until the day he moved out two years later. My aunt and cousin said they'd never experienced anything remotely weird in that room, so it was clear they had a preference for my brother. My daughter has several old porcelain dolls. When she was nine, she got a sudden interest in them. I had never bought them for her because they are often very delicate, and I didn't want her to break them. I took her to the Goodwill and she begged me for one. I let her buy it, since she takes very good care of her things, and I quickly noticed something was different in my house. I felt like I was being watched. Shortly after that, she asked for another doll at the Goodwill. Over the years, she has collected three. I noticed she was very careful about which ones she picked. She treated the dolls like gold, and she keeps them sitting up in the corner of her bed. She tells me the dolls like me, since I'm so careful with them when I move them to make her bed. I see shadows around my house and hear soft voices. Nothing that makes me feel in danger, and I'm getting used to it. But it is, nonetheless, very freaky. A few years ago, I was reading a forum, and a woman said she had a haunted photograph. She said that the picture was taken of her, and there was a ghost girl beside her that wasn't there when the picture was taken. More importantly, she said that anyone that saw the photo had bad things happen to them. Naturally, I had to see it. She sent me a link. It was as she described. It didn't look scary to me at all, and nothing happened to me. Eventually, I forgot about it. Not long ago, I was looking for something in my messages, and came across the link to the photo. I looked at it again, and spent probably two minutes staring and trying to look at the ghost girl in detail. Then I closed the tab and forgot about it. Not two hours later, my stepmom calls me to tell me my dad had a polymery embolism. He lived. On his way home, my husband hit a deer and totaled his car. And that night, my daughter got a horrible stomach bug that left us so dehydrated we had to go to the ER. I am never looking at that photo again. I'm 22, and as my mom was pregnant with me, my grandfather passed away from lung cancer. The only thing he ever got me was this little clown doll that was supposed to hang over my crib. When you pull the clown's leg down, it plays a little music box star song as it winds itself back up. Now I know this already sounds like a cheesy horror story, but let's stick with it. When I was a child, maybe seven or eight, I used to have the clown hanging from the metal curtain tiebacks in my room, probably because I was too young to have read or watched it. But one night, my mom walked up the stairs and in my room while I was asleep, because the clown was playing its song but it had its legs pulled down. Apparently, it played for about five minutes, and I do remember my mum recording it on her old flip phone, and showed me that morning. We actually found out later in the day, that on that night, my great-grandma had passed away, so my grandfather's mum. My mum is super adamant it was her dad, sending some sort of signal, but I'd be interested to know what you guys think. We were in my daughter's room, going through the whole bedtime routine. My wife sat on the bed, brushing my daughter's hair, to put it in a braid, while I stood around, waiting to tuck her in and say goodnight. 
While waiting, I commented on a collectible 2010 holiday Barbie doll, still boxed, that was given to my daughter by our neighbor. I was curious to know if she had taken it out of the box. And my wife replied that yes, she did because dolls are meant to be played with. To that comment, I mentioned to my daughter that both her mother and I had collectible dolls tucked away in our closet, each of them still in boxes and never opened. These were a Bruce Lee action figure and a Jesse the Governor Ventura doll, and a 95th anniversary collectible Raggedy Ann doll. As I said this, my wife quickly corrected me and said no, that it's a Cabbage Patch doll that she owned, and that one of them would tan well. Having just reorganized my closet one day before, I was pretty sure it was a Raggedy Ann doll, but my wife swore up and down that she never owned such a thing. Curiosity got the best of me. And so I pulled the box out of the closet and brought it back to the room to show her. As I held it up, my wife stopped brushing my daughter's hair and slowly shook her head. And trying not to scare my daughter, mouthed the words, it's not mine. I've never seen it before. With a very serious look in her eyes. My wife has an incredibly sharp mind and a memory that sometimes terrifies me. So I know she wasn't trying to pull my leg. I asked if it might have been given to her by her sister, but a quick phone call confirmed that her sister had not. She once did, however, give her a collectible Mary Poppins doll, which both of them remembered. So, here we are now in our home, a doll for which we have no idea where it came from. I thought I had chills already running down my spine at that point, until I realized the doll was coincidentally the same as Annabelle, the haunted doll, which spawned horror movies and are now kept in the Ed and Lorraine Warren McCult Museum. It's probably nothing, but seriously, we freaked out. My wife, does have a Cabbage Patch Kid tucked away in another closet, but it's not this one. My dad passed away when I was 11. Every summer we went to a little town which had a porcelain doll museum. I loved going there, hanging out with my dad and had several dolls myself, but the one I loved the most was one that resembled an Indian girl with two braids. I kept it on a shelf that was facing my bed, pushed it to the corner, and I had it for three to four years. I didn't even touch it, I only admired it. Well, as I mentioned, my father died in December. Fast forward half a year later, it's June, summer holidays, and I'm laying on my bed with my laptop, chatting with my friends at midnight. Both my door and window were open, but it was quiet outside with no wind, and the doll suddenly fell to the floor. I was startled by the noise, but confused since it didn't shatter. The shelf was 1.7 meters high, so I turned off the light, covered myself in a blanket, and went to sleep, hoping I could. The next morning, the doll was still on the ground face down. I started to think how it could fall. It was protected from wind, although there was none and a 40 centimeter empty space in front of it. I got up shaking and slowly approached it. I sat on the floor and picked it up. It was intact, except for one thing. The left braid was cut in half, not torn, cut. I quickly put it away and never touched it again, nor even took a look at it. I still don't really know what happened. I tried to think it was my dad comforting me, but as I grew older, that didn't seem logical. Why would my dad, who loved me the most, try to hurt my favorite doll? I don't know what's been happening, but everything has been weird in our home lately. My cousin said it was probably a ghost joking, but it got me thinking. Everything in our refrigerator has been expiring and is full of mold. Nothing was supposed to expire until the end of next year. And yes, our refrigerator temperature is fine, it's 36 Fahrenheit. The dishwasher was full of maggots as well, which almost caused me to vomit. I've been hearing soft footsteps lately in the living room when I'm home alone. The walls are soundproof as well, so it can't be my neighbors. And I have two cats, but they're always in my bedroom. 
Even my cats, for God's sakes, have been hissing and running away from the pantry when I open it. I removed all the bags and food, which caused them to get even more scared. This all started about two weeks ago when my mother brought antique dolls at the thrift store, which yes, I know is a stretch to even think they're haunted. And it might be a coincidence, but I'm not taking any chances. This might all have been something to do with those dolls. I don't really understand why this is happening now. I'm very uncomfortable in my own home. We can't move out. We can't afford anything like that at the moment. I just want to know what is going on.